Okay, so Daniel 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the, the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Okay, so King Nebuchadnezzar decides that he's going to make a statue of himself. 60 cubits high. Now a cubit is 18 inches. So we're talking about a 90 foot statue of Nebuchadnezzar that he makes of himself. And it's six feet wide, or or six cubits wide, which is nine feet wide. This thing is enormous. And it says that it's set up in the plain of Dura. Now, this is about six miles or so south of where Babylon was. And it's an area that, that is a plain, so everybody could see this thing in all the surrounding area. And in fact, um, there was a man named William Heslop in 1937 who said this about the plains of Dura. He said, On the plains of Dura there stands today a rectilinear mound about 20 feet high, an exact square of about 46 feet at the base, resembling the pedestal of a colossal statue. Mm. So even in modern times, the base of this massive statue has been discovered. So he would set it up there so that everybody around would worship him. right? Now why would he do this? Well, in the last chapter, we were reading about this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of an image of a, of a man that at the top was gold, and then down on the chest and arms was silver, and then the belly and thighs was bronze, and then the legs and the feet were iron, and then iron mixed with ceramic clay. And he has this dream, and then Daniel comes along and he interprets the dream. And Daniel says, oh, these are a succession of kingdoms that are going to come along after you. The gold head, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. But the chest and the arms of silver, that's going to be the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the belly of and, and the thighs of bronze, that's going to be the kingdom of Greece. And then on uh, to iron, that's going to be Rome. And so there's going to be a succession of kingdoms coming after your kingdom. So why would he make a statue of himself 90 feet tall? Well, notice what he makes it out of. It's, it's made out of gold. Now, he was the head of gold. Now what he's probably saying is, look, there's going to be no succession of kingdoms. My kingdom is going to rule forever. I'm going to be gold from head to toe. Okay, so this is him kind of puffing himself up with pride. You all have to bow down to worship me. My kingdom's going to reign forever. Very interesting about Nebuchadnezzar. This guy had been touched so many times by God, and yet still he kept doing all these crazy things to kind of elevate himself and puff himself up. Hello, Alex. Welcome. We're in Daniel chapter 3, looking at... uh, Nebuchadnezzar's giant statue of himself. <laughs> you showing instability already. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. We've been warned, and you know, this is how it's going to be. And no, no, no. no. Yeah. I'll, I'll over, overrule this uh, stuff. Uh, dream from God. Yeah, that's right. Mm. I'm going to do it my way. Mm. So. When we ask the question, why did he do it? We, we have to kind of go to the power behind the man. And what power is at work behind this? Satan. Satan. The devil is behind everything that's going on right here. Pride was the devil's downfall. And so what the devil is trying to do is and you know, get everybody else to be proud so that that will be their downfall too. I'm going to read to you what it says about the devil in Isaiah 14. Now, if you really want to know what the devil's like, you can read two chapters in the Old Testament. And they're both multiples of 14. It's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14, in verse 12, I'll just read it out to you. It says this about the devil. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Do you notice one word that's keep, that is uh, repeated in his statement there? Oh. I. He has an eye disease, doesn't he? It's all about me, me, me. Me, 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 I love myself. I have my picture on my shelf. That is Satan. Right? And that then becomes Nebuchadnezzar. I love myself. And I don't just have a picture on my shelf. I have a 90-foot statue of myself. But I want you to notice what else God says to Lucifer in Isaiah 14. When he says, I will be like the Most High, he says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So God will not share his glory with any person or any created being. He calls him Lucifer here. God created Lucifer, but Lucifer became the devil when he chose in his heart to rebel against God. He was created an angel, but he became a devil. You see? So it wasn't God's fault. It was his fault. He rebelled. And when he rebelled, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 12 that he took one-third of the angels with him and they became demons. So we think about that. That means that we have two-thirds of the angels on our side. One third are on his side. And they're in rebellion against God. They're not more powerful than God because God with a snap of his finger can destroy the devil and his demons. But God allows the devil to do some things in this world for a time. And then eventually he's going to cast him into the pit. But pride was his downfall. He puffed himself up. I want to be like God. And so God won't share His glory with anyone. He won't allow anything else to be worshipped in the end. He alone reserves that right. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So the devil is always trying to puff us up with pride. Because if he can puff us up with pride, what he does is he gets us on the opposite side of God because God will oppose the proud but God gives grace to the humble so we see today a lot of talk about self-esteem a lot of talk about self-exaltation a lot of that is psychology and what that means is I am worshipping myself it's pride lifting, uh, lifting ourselves up. It's self-love. Self is not the answer to our problems. Self is the problem. And so what we need to do is humble ourselves. God will come in and save us from that. And so he's trying to puff us up and we need to resist it. The devil's greatest success will eventually come 
in a time that we know of as the Great Tribulation period. In the Great Tribulation, the devil is actually going to get a person, like he did here with Nebuchadnezzar, who will take all his temptations and he will become an object of worship for the whole world. We know him as the Antichrist. And um, I'd like you to to turn with me to the book of Revelation. We're going to read 13 verses or so in this book about the Antichrist. See if you can uh, recognize a parallel between what Nebuchadnezzar received from the devil and what the Antichrist received from the devil. Revelation 13 says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And so, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months, three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Those whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Don't worry. So, this beast that's being referred to here is the Antichrist. The dragon that gives him the power is later on defined in the book of Revelation as the devil. So, he's the one who's giving the power to this person that is named the beast here. The Antichrist is Satan's greatest greatest weapon, his greatest invention. If he could get a man to do everything that he wanted him to do, he would be the Antichrist. And that's what he is in the end. And so, this guy, this Antichrist, has another person who is sort of his sidekick who comes along and he makes an image of the Antichrist that everybody has to bow down to or else they're killed. Very similar to what we see here in Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar is kind of a type of Antichrist who will come. And this is what Satan is trying to do in, in human lives all through history. He's trying to get people puffed up with pride 
self-exaltation, self-esteem, self-love. But God opposes that kind of thing. And so going back to the book of Daniel, he says, everybody needs to bow down and worship my image or they're going to be burned up in a fiery furnace. Verse 7, So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar set up. So all these people... Now Nebuchadnezzar was a world ruler. He had conquered many nations. He had brought many people to this place. And he said, all of you people now need to bow down and worship me. And when the music started to play, it had power over them. And, and when that started, they bowed down and they worshipped they worship Nebuchadnezzar. It's very interesting, the power of music. Music has power for both good and for evil. It depends on the words that are put into the music. You know, you, you just have to look back at, at what happened in this country and in, in what the West over the last 50 years. You know, the Beatles were, were and probably are considered the greatest rock group that ever existed. They did more to change a whole generation of young people in the West than any other rock group ever. And, and probably anybody else in modern culture. And just shortly after they ascended to be very popular, they started to get into psychedelic drugs and Eastern religion. And they would go to the ashrams over in India. They would follow uh, Mahatma, or what was his name? Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And because of that, and because people looked at the, and listened to their music and looked at them and worshipped them, they were led into psychedelic drugs and the worship of Eastern gods. Because, hey, the Beatles were doing it. Music has tremendous power, both for evil, but also for good. You know, the, the music that Christians sing is wrapped with the, the lyrics, the words of truth. And those lyrics are, are how you know, we get to know the Lord. It's, it's the, the Word of God wrapped in music and sung. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, pastored over in Deal for many years, he said... In his town, they just didn't have very much solid Bible teaching, but he got linked in with some very good Christian music. And through that Christian music, it was his theology lesson. He learned more and more about God, about the Bible, through the music. And then eventually went on to study um, study the Bible on his own. But music has tremendous power. You see what happens here. He says, when they heard the sound of the music, that's when they started to bow down. Verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. That's <laughs> what you always want to say to a, 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 a king who flies off the handle. Live forever. It basically, it means you're looking good today. You know, it looks like you lost a little weight. Um, just trying to butter him up. <clears throat> you, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews from whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. So, these guys, these Chaldeans, they were the wise men of Babylon. They were the guys who instructed the king and gave him counsel. But Chaldeans were also a race. So they were like Babylonians. 
as opposed to the Jews who were also wise men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, had been elevated to the position of wise men, as we saw in chapters 1 and 2. But they were part of the Chaldean clan. The Chaldeans were a specific race within the wise men. So, as Nebuchadnezzar raised these Jews up into positions of authority within the wise men, and he considered them to be ten times better than the other wise men, they got a little jealous, those Chaldeans. And so now that the Jews, when everybody else is bowing down, and they don't bow down, these Chaldeans start thinking, okay, here's our chance. We can take these guys now. We can get rid of them. And so they come and they say, these Jews, by the way, you set them up over the affairs of Babylon. Now, we didn't put them there, but you did. But they're not bowing down to you. You see what they're doing? So, verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And notice... And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Now, to Nebuchadnezzar's credit, he interviewed these guys. Often, these ancient kings would just fly off the handle and they'd say, that's it, you're you're toast, off with your head or thrown into the furnace. Wouldn't give them a second chance. But he interviewed them, and I think the reason was he, he highly respected them. He did consider them to be ten times better than all the other wise men, and I do believe that they were good employees. So he, he respected them. And so he comes and he asks them, is it true? But notice at the end, he says, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Now, he's, he's not saying, your God, you know, you've got a God that he can't deliver you. He's saying, who is the God? No God. No God can deliver you from my hands. In other words, I'm stronger than any God. Now, that's pride. Can you see how the devil had infected him with pride? Now, Jesus, remember, he said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted so in God's kingdom the way up is the way down if you humble yourself God will lift you up but if you exalt yourself God will take you down and so here Nebuchadnezzar in pride is saying there's no God stronger than me I'm the greatest I'm the entire not just the head of gold I'm the entire statue. I'm I'm head to toe. I'm gold. My kingdom will stand forever. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Bold. Don't you like that boldness? The strength? Now, notice what they say first of all. We have no need to answer you in this matter. So in other words, you know us. Uh, If you weren't here for the first two chapters, let me just give you a quick summation. In the first chapter, Daniel and his friends purposed in their hearts that they wouldn't defile themselves with the king's 
delicacies, which was unkosher food. And they said, well, it's against our law to eat this stuff, so we're just not going to do it. You feed us vegetables and water. That'll be enough for us. And so they honored God above the, the way the, they were getting pressured to eat this other food. And, and God honored them. So they humbled themselves and God lifted them up. And they were, that was their character. Nebuchadnezzar would have known this. So he says, uh, they say, you don't, we don't need to answer you. You know what we're like. And then, notice, our God whom we serve is able, He's able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And notice, and He will deliver us from your hand, O King. Now, Nebuchadnezzar asked, Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And they're saying, very confidently, our God will deliver us from your hands. He will do it. Notice the next verse though. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Even if our God doesn't deliver us, even if we are thrown into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, we still won't bow down. Now that is resolve. That's saying... Uh, it's not just going back to chapter 1 saying they purpose in their heart they wouldn't defile themselves. I mean, there was a penalty attached here that if they didn't bow down, they were going to be burnt alive. And so they had already made this decision. Even if we have to die, we will not bow down to your gods. We won't bow down to your image. Question for you. How do you stop believers like that. Well, you can't. You can't stop somebody with that kind of attitude. This is why Christianity is such a threat to communist governments and to any kind of a fascist government. They hate Christians because they want to be the top people. And yet... The Christians within their society say, no, we have a a greater God, and even if you punish us, we won't bow down to your God. We won't bow down to you. Not even death deters believers who say, I'm purposed in my heart, I'm not going to bow down. So, one of the strongest temptations of the devil is to say, unless you give in, you're going to die. I mean, we get threats like you're going to lose your job or people are going to make fun of you. But the greatest temptation is you're going to die. Now, if you resolve that in your mind, I don't even care if I die. You can't be stopped. God will use you so powerfully. You think about what we see in the Bible with Peter and the apostles. I'd like to read to you what we're actually going to be studying in a couple weeks in Acts chapter 5. Acts 5 and verse 22 says, But when the officers came and did not find the apostles in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what would be the outcome, or what would the outcome be? So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Notice that. They tell him, You can't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. You can't keep preaching the gospel. And they say, We're not going to obey you. God told us to do this, so we're going to keep doing what God said. 
The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are His witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thodius rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should speak no more in the name of Jesus, and then let them go. So they're beaten, told not to speak any more for Jesus, and then they let him go, and then it says, So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They get beaten, told not to preach anymore, and they go out, praise the Lord, we just got beat for the name of Jesus. And then they went out and did the same thing that got them in trouble in the first place. They kept on doing what God told them to do. How do you stop people like this? You can't. They just keep going and going and going. I'm going to read to you just a a shorter part of Acts now about Paul's life. Listen to this. Chapter 21, verse 7. I think that's right. Let me just check. Yeah. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemy, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day... We who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea, entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And we stayed many days. And a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Well then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of Jesus Christ. And so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. So this prophet comes and he says, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be bound. And all the people heard it and they started crying. They said, don't go. You shouldn't be bound. This must not be God's will. And Paul says, why are you crying and making me weep? Look, I'm I'm, I'm willing to go up there not only to be bound, but to die. You can't stop a person like that. And throughout history, we see people just like... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were believers, who would not give in. Who would not give in to the temptation to bow down. Christians during the Roman Empire were martyred for their faith because the Romans said, you either worship Caesar or we'll kill you. Okay? Because the Roman Empire had to have a unifying religion. And they said, well, certainly it can't be Christianity. It must be Caesar worship. So you could worship any other god you wanted to, including Jesus. As long as you took this pinch of incense and put it on the altar of Caesar and you worshipped him too. 
And the, the Christians would say, we cannot worship any other God except the one true God. We won't worship Him. And said they were thrown to the lions, they were thrown in the gladiator contest, and they were killed. Not because they worship Jesus, but because they refused to worship Caesar. How do you stop people like that? It's amazing. Same thing in modern times. Nazi Germany. I've got a picture here. You see this? What are they doing? What do you call that? Heil Hitler. Hail Hitler. Worship Hitler. Okay? This is bowing down to one man, isn't it? Now, if you're a Christian in that environment, you're going to suffer. And, and those who are true Christians, they, the Nazis co-opted many of the professing church, the, the state church. They became Nazis. <coughs> you see them on, in their clerical robes with little Nazi signs on them. But the true Christians, they had to go underground or they were arrested and, and sent to concentration camps. I found this a very interesting photo. You see that? Everybody doing the Hitler salute. And there's one man right here with his arms crossed saying, nope, not going to do it. See that? I'll pass this around so you can have a look. Now that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in modern times. <coughs> you can have that. pass that down. Also, go to North Korea today. And you'll see a statue. North Korea is the worst place on earth, by the way, to be a Christian in the present time. More Christians are persecuted there than any other country. They have thousands and thousands of Christians in concentration camps in North Korea, as we speak, to the death. They don't get out. And so this is Kim Il-sung, or Kim sung Il, I can't remember which one. They have a massive statue of him right there in the center of uh, I think it's Pyongyang in North Korea and you notice the people bowing down now if you're a Christian in that culture you can't bow down and they don't and many many of them even today they're dying for their faith in, in this culture I'll pass that around to you. the first commandment in the ten commandments says you shall have no other gods besides me or before me do you know what the second commandment of the Ten Commandments says? Graven image. You shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven or on earth, any created thing. So you're not to not to make a graven image and bow down to any created thing, whether it be an angel or a man or a beast of some kind, animal or a star or whatever. So. No other gods and no graven images. Now, that means if, if we're believers, we can't just worship God amongst a multitude of gods. We can only have the one true God to worship. When we lived up in York, um, Lisa and I were ministering to a lady who came out of a Hindu background. And we brought her to church a few times and she was very interested in Jesus. And in fact, she wanted to pray to receive Jesus as her Lord and Savior. But she was unwilling to give up her false gods. She wanted Jesus as part of her pantheon of gods. Okay, so because the Hindu, they have millions of gods. So you just add Jesus onto your millions of gods. Wow, sure, I want some Jesus, but I also want some Vishnu and I want some other God too. But if you're a Christian, if you're a true believer, you can only have one God and you can't worship any other God. So that's why these people in the Roman Empire were being put to death because they wouldn't worship Caesar along with Jesus. So here we see. They say, look, our God is able and He will deliver us. But if not, 
was still not going to bow down. Now, by the way, there's a very, very interesting story that comes from this verse. Back in 1940, the um, British expeditionary force that was um, sent into Western Europe to try to protect from Nazi advancement through Poland and elsewhere, they were driven back all the way to Dunkirk. And you you know probably the, the story around that. The Nazis were right there and they could have wiped out about 350,000 soldiers on the beaches of Dunkirk. And it was a very tense moment in the nation and they sent word, how are you doing? And the army sent back a three-word reply, but if not, or in the King James Version it was, and if not. And immediately people understood what they meant. They were referring to this verse right here. But if not, so in other words, our God is able to help us. But if not, we're not going to bow down to Caesar. We're going to die on this beach. Or not Caesar, what am I saying? Hitler. We're going to die on this beach. And it stirred the nation, the conscience of the nation. And you remember what happened? The, the miraculous rescue from Dunkirk with all those boats going over and pulling them all off the beach. What it shows us is something very fascinating. That they could send this three-word reply and there was enough Bible knowledge in this country at that time that they would understand what that meant. Now, if that happened today, people would say, what is he talking about? But if not, I don't understand it. You know? So, um, in 2001, when... George Bush was inaugurated to be the President of the United States. He said in his inauguration speech, um, we don't want to be like uh, the man, um, we don't want to be like those who see a man on the way to Jericho and pass by on the other side. And one of the news reporters said, I didn't understand what that meant. This is on national news. And the guy says, I don't understand what that means. Total biblical illiteracy. I mean, we we should have a basic knowledge of the, the things of the Word of God. There was back in 1940. It's been eroded. And so that's why we spend a lot of time in church teaching the Bible. Because you're not going to hear it anywhere else. And so if the church is not teaching it, you're not going to hear it in popular culture. So... Let's pray that that we would continue to do that, but also that other churches would really start to teach the Bible once again. And so if you go to a church, you're going to hear the Bible taught. So they say, but if not, we're still not going to bow down. Now look in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So I kind of get the idea that when he, when he interviewed them, he was kind of, okay boys, you know, you might have had a little blip in, the, in your obedience, but, you know, just bow down. They said, no, we're not going to bow down. And then he started to get really angry. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Apparently he had burned a lot of people in the furnace before. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats and their trousers, their turbans and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Seems pretty bad news right now for them, right? But you know what? Our trials are God's opportunities. God doesn't look at them the way we look at them. He says, okay, you're in in the midst of a trial. This is my opportunity to show my power in your life. And so this is what's going to happen. You know... If you want a testimony of God's faithfulness and power in your life, you must be tested. There is no testimony without a test. And here these guys are in a great test, thrown into a fiery furnace. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he arose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the first of, of the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. Who do you think that is? Who would be down there in the midst of the fiery furnace with these guys? Jesus. Jesus. Son of God. He's with them. Notice three things. When they got thrown in there, they were loose, they were walking, not hurt, and they were with Jesus. Just remember that. We're going to go on and talk about that a little bit. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. So God had saved them so completely in this trial in the fiery furnace that there was not even the smell of smoke on their bodies. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made in ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So he got the point. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Notice something. He says in verse 28, he sent his angel. In the Old Testament, Jesus Christ appears many times as the angel of the Lord. Because the angel of the Lord here is spoken of as the Son of God in verse 25. So the Old Testament, the Jews knew the angel of the Lord as being the Son of God. Okay, now we know him further as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the third person of the Trinity. But they knew him as the Son of God. They had this understanding that he was the Son of God. And there he is in the midst of the burning fiery furnace with them. Now as we close, I want to just make some application about the fiery furnace for our own lives. The fiery furnace is just like any trial that we go through, any fiery trial, any really difficult trial that we go through. God allows His people to go into the midst of fiery trials for very good reasons. Number one, it's so that we can become loose from things that bind us and that we can walk with the Lord more more easily. Notice, when they were thrown into the midst of the fiery furnace, the only things that burned were the ropes that bound them. That was it. So when we're thrown into a difficult trial, what God is going to do is He's going to burn off the things that actually keep us bound up. The things that keep us from walking freely with the Lord. God uses trials to set us free. Paul understood this. I'm going to read to you what he says in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, Unless I should be exalted above measure... By the abundance of the revelations, he saw pictures of heaven and he was just blown away by it. He said, unless I was exalted above measure, unless I got filled with pride, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness.
Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. So because he had seen all these great things, God gave him something that would humble him to allow him to be free. It was called a, a, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him or to beat him, to keep him humbled. What was it? Some people think it was an eye disease. Because when he went to Galatia, he said, you would have gladly plucked out your eyes and given them to me because you love me. And then he said, do you see what large letters I write with? And so some people say that he had some kind of eye disease. <clears throat> Whatever it was, he was pleading, God, take it away from me. And God said, no, I'm not going to take this away from you because in the midst of it, you're going to learn my power. And sometimes God will allow us to go through a long trial so we understand his power in our lives. I've been greatly encouraged by Sue's testimony recently of what God did with her in the hospital when she was there for a month. She said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Because here she is being treated for cancer, and yet God worked in that to heal her of something she'd been praying about for many, many months. And it set her free in her walk with the Lord. A wonderful freedom has come about. So why do we go through trials? Why are we in the fiery furnace sometimes? It's to be loose and walking with the Lord. And I think the other thing is, is so that we can see Jesus more clearly. It wasn't until they were thrown into the midst of the fiery furnace that there was the Son of God, a fourth man who was walking around with them. But when they got in there, then, then they saw Him more clearly. When you go through trials, you can be sure that you're going to see the Lord Jesus more clearly. Once Jesus um, told the disciples, you need to get in the boat and cross over on the other side. Out of Mark chapter 4, I'm going to read this little section to you. Now, He said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already being filled. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. (laughs) Imagine the scene. You're in a boat, you're going across the sea, and this huge storm rises up. And you're starting to freak out. And you look back, and Jesus is just asleep. He's in your boat, but he's sleeping. And so they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? You're just sleeping there. Don't you care that we're about to sink and die? You don't, you don't seem to care. You're just at peace there, sleeping. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus was in the boat the whole time. But it was in the midst of the trial that they finally saw who He really was. He's the one who can calm the sea. And so unless they had gone into the trial, they wouldn't have seen Jesus as clearly as they saw Him. Peter says this in 1 Peter 1.6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He talks about our faith being more precious than gold, though it's tested by fire. In the old days, this is how they would purify gold. They would take the gold, they put it in a crucible, and they'd heat it, 
to, I don't know, it's like a thousand degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Really, really hot till the gold starts to melt. And then once it starts to melt, the impurities would rise to the surface and they would scrape those impurities off and then they'd let it cool down. And they'd look at it and they'd say, oh, it needs to go again. And they'd heat it up and they'd wipe the impurities, the, the dross that would come up to the surface, they'd wipe it off and then they'd let it cool down. And they'd keep doing this until they could see their reflection in the gold. And when they saw the reflection in the gold, they knew it was pure gold. And that's exactly what God does with our faith. He heats things up in the fiery furnace of trials and afflictions, difficulties. And then our faith is purified. It starts, we, the, the dross comes up. We start to get bitter and complain, Lord, why are you doing this? And maybe saying some things we shouldn't say. And then he, he wipes the dross off. And he lets it cool down. He says, oh, I've got to do that again. And he does it again. And then he, oh, I've got to do that again. And he keeps doing it until he finally sees his reflection in us. And he says, okay, that, that gold is purified. Now that process doesn't stop until we get to heaven. But it's over and over again. And he makes us more and more like him. Our faith is like precious gold, purified. Does God always save us out of trials, out of fiery furnaces? Does He? No. But God will always be with us through them. And that's all that really matters. If we know that He's with us, we can get through anything. He's never promised us an easy ride, but through the furnace, through the trials, He's got a plan, He's got a purpose. And so this is what we see here as, as, we, as we look at this chapter. Now one more very quick picture that we see here in this chapter is this. It is a great picture of the tribulation. This time in the end of seven years when God's going to be pouring out wrath upon the earth, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a picture of the 144,000 sealed of the nation of Israel who are protected during the tribulation period. The fiery furnace is the wrath of God poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. Notice who was absent during this whole chapter? Daniel. Daniel is a picture of the church that gets raptured before the trial, the tribulation happens. And so we see a great picture of the, the tribulation period here. And so, Father, we thank you for this. Tonight, we just thank you that um, these men made their stand, but you've also given us your spirit that we can also make a stand now. And we thank you, Lord, for the trials that you allow us to go into and you go through with us that perfect our faith and make it pure gold. And thank you for those times that you wipe off the impurities and the dross. And we want to do two things tonight, Lord. We want to determine that we're not going to bow down to the gods of this world. We're not going to bow down to anyone else but you. But also, Lord, that we will trust you that when we get into a trial, that you have a plan and a purpose for it to make us more and more like you to lose us so that we can walk more closely and to help us to see you more clearly. And we, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.